Good afternoon. Or is it evening? How's everybody? Hey. Everybody's good? Oh, well, that's good to hear. All right. Well, I'm glad to see you all. Let me make sure. Is this Zoom class three? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. So we've got Stephen, Michelle, and Tashira. Tashira's not going to be able to join us tonight, I don't think. So we've got Stephen and Michelle. And if somebody else wants to go. All right. Let's see. Let me look at one more thing and we'll be ready to go. Okay, let me get back up here. Yeah. Here we go. That's what I'm looking for. So it'll open. There it goes. Okay. Let me get back here. As everybody is joining us. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right, let me share my screen. I think we've got who we're going to have for at least the time being. It's being cognizant of the time, I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, let me share my screen, and we'll look at the weekly schedule to see where we are, and then we'll talk about our stars of the week. All right, so our weekly schedule, we are in class three, Zoom class three on Wednesday, September 25th. We've got Glickman chapters 12 through 13, 12, 10 through 12, 13, 14, 15, 17. All right, we will be back on Zoom the next two weeks as well, October the 2nd and October the 9th. And then our next weekend is together in charlotte is the 19th of october so that's where we are so we've got three weeks in a row here that we'll be together all right let me stop my share so we can get ready for our presentations all right our stars of the week all right our first star of the week is michelle michelle didn't forget i like people who don't forget um, she didn't forget that you have a clinical internship log that you're on your honor to do every semester. You know that. She has uploaded hers with a lot of hours and a lot of good activities. I liked her activities. They were leadership activities. Um, you know, one of the things about just going to meetings is sitting in the back. That doesn't show a lot of leadership. I like that Michelle's activity showed her in charge of things and being a leader. Good job, Michelle. Excellent. Um, somebody asked me why I'm so hard on y'all about presentations. And I said, well, you know, they've only got one proposal defense and one final defense. I said, but that's not the deal. This is a leadership. Um, yeah, Janiqua, I, I, I remembered that, that she's not going to be with us tonight and prayers for her. Um, talking about Shira. Um, but the proposal defense and the final defense where you have to get up and, and do your, do your presentation. And just like last week's when we were together in Charlotte, <clears throat> getting up and doing your presentation, folks, this is practice for leading a group of people. Um, if you can't get up and speak extemporaneously about whatever topic it is, you can't lead. We can get anybody to come in and read a PowerPoint that shows an absence of leadership. If you can't get up and speak extemporaneously about things, 
And just being a part of a group or being a part of a committee, if you're not leading it, that's not much of a leadership experience. Now, I agree the, the first tenet of leadership is followership. You've got to learn to be a good follower, but you've done that your whole career. Now it's time to step out of that and become a leader. Let me show you an example of an excellent PowerPoint, excellent, that's completely wrong for what, we're, for what I'm talking about. So one of mine that's a little further ahead of y'all sent me this last night, and I want y'all to tell me what's wrong with this leadership experience. Let me share my screen. This is her All right, she's getting ready for her proposal defense next week. And so here it is. Program assessment of the perceived impact of school-based mental health programs on the success of elementary school students in Title I schools in the urban district in North Carolina. Title's good. It's a little wordy, but it's good. I am still with you. All right. And, and this is appropriate. These are the people that... <coughs> She wants to acknowledge straight to the point. Here's where it goes off the track. It's more than 30 words. Boy, boy, howdy. That's, that's the only appropriate slide that she's got right there. That's more than enough words. Now, what did I tell her? And this is, this is the good stuff right here, what I told her. Save this copy separately. Now, go through all slides and reduce the content of each slide by at least half, too many words. You must have just big ideas on each slide and be able to speak extemporaneously to each slide. The trick here is to memorize the full slides that you made, but then present the condensed slides so it looks like you're speaking without reading. That's the trick. Yes, we want all the information that's on all those slides, but we don't want you to sit and read it to us. And we want, and if you can speak to it extemporaneously without reading it, we think you know it. We think leaders who can do that, that they know what they're talking about, more, more willing to follow them. When you show up at your proposal or final defense, if you can speak to it, then they know this stuff. Again, we can hire anybody. We can get anybody off the street to come read PowerPoints. Way too many words. You must be able to speak to the information. Speak to it, not read it, if you want to lead anybody. This is one of those lessons in leadership. I cannot overstress the importance of this. I'm just telling you right now. If you can't command the room, somebody else will. And we all know that technology goes wrong from time to time. What if you can't tell your PowerPoint up there? What are you going to do now, hero? You don't know your material. You're going to cancel the meeting if, you, if your PowerPoint doesn't work? You know, don't say, don't tell Dr. Bull I said anything good about him, by the way. But I'll tell a story on him that happened recently. Now, you know he, his area is instructional technology. He's supposed to be a technology person. He came to our latest faculty meeting. The technology wouldn't work. Not his fault. 
and you know, some smart aleck in the back like me said, if we only knew somebody that was in instructional technology. Uh, but what was he able to do? He was able to speak to the agenda without having any, any uh, without having all that stuff because he knew his material. We didn't have to stop. We didn't have to go back. We didn't sit for an hour waiting on an IT person to come and fix it or any of that. We carried on about our business because he knew the material that was that that he was going to present. Leaders are prepared. They know their material. Now, I'm the worst by far, but because I'll say the quiet part out loud. Um, you know, I don't care. But a lot of people won't say anything but the lessons that they'll take away is i'm not confident in this leader they don't know what they're talking about have you ever felt that way yourself you do not want to be that person who relies on the technology or the powerpoint to take place rather than exhibit exuding personal leadership and personal leadership skills so i can't i can't overstress the importance of being able to speak to your material all right, our second our second star of the week is Sarah. Um, you know, she was I'm quite sure she was the young lady who sat in front in class. She has the most points. She's out wearing it out, but that's a good thing. Now, we always need somebody to set the curve. She's way ahead in points, and that's good. It's a reminder to all of us that you're on your honor to keep up with your stuff. I'm not gonna send you an email every Monday. Try to get your stuff in every week. Don't get behind. You know how the world works. You get behind, you never get caught up. And so that's part of leadership too. It's not being the you, you can't be you can't be the pigtail. You can't be at the, at the end of the line, and be part of the show. All right. Yeah, that that's the way that goes. I mean, you want to be the show, not the fellow behind the show, the pigtail, the fellow with the bucket and the scoop. Um, you need to be out front leading, and you do that by the work that you do and the dedication that you have. So I'll tell my story and we'll go into tonight's presentation. So I was principal at Eastway, last, one of the last junior highs in Charlotte. If you know anything about Eastway, it's out of Independence, right out past the old Coliseum. It's now called Bojangles Arena. But that was the original Charlotte Coliseum. And the circus always came to town. Well, you know, the, everybody wanted to see the elephants. Now, you, you know, they had to bring the elephants in on boxcars on the train. So they would bring them in, and the train tracks are over on the north side of Independence, and the Coliseum sits right on the on, on Independence, the old Coliseum, but right on the south side. So they would unload the elephants, and they'd walk them through town, across the bridge there at Commonwealth, over to Monroe, and come into the Coliseum at the backside. And Chantilly Elementary is right over there, and so a lot of the kids and parents would line up, and I mean, it was a big deal, would line up the day that the, that the circus came to town. And they would line up up and down Monroe Road to see the elephants. That was, that was the star of the show. They had everybody. They'd have the jugglers and the clowns, and everybody else, but, the, but everybody wanted to see the elephants. And of course, you got elephants, you got elephant poop. So there was a fellow with a shovel and a bucket following behind the elephants. And somebody said something smart, you know, like, well, that's a terrible job. I'd quit that if I was you. And he said, what, and give up show business? He wasn't the show. If you don't know your material, you're the fellow with the bucket at the end of the line. You're not the show. People came to see the show, not you with the bucket and the scoop. Uh, people who read PowerPoints are not the show. That's my metaphor for the evening. All right, who's our first presenter of the evening? Thank you to our stars of the week. It was Jonathan and do I need to go back and look again? All right. Zoom class three. Stephen, Michelle, and then of course Deshir is not going to be with us. So Stephen, you lead us out. Is Stephen with us? All right, Michelle, it's up to you then. I'm not here. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, okay, let's do this. 
<laughs> okay, let's do this. Can I share? Yes, please do. Okay. Oh. I'm going to uh to talk about my experiences. Um, I read through chapter 13, I read through chapter 14, and I was able to relate it to me as an administrator at the Governor's Village STEM Academy. This chapter focuses on evaluating the teachers and trying to improve uh, their skill and also eventually improve student achievement. But he, um, the author encouraged us to work in collaboration with the teachers and also to look at data. So I'm going to go through each. Um, I wrote that, but I can speak from experience. So what he talked about, he said he talked about assessing and and planning. And then he said he says that assessing you have to be able to look at where the teacher was and is today, and you have to plan accordingly, and you have to have a goal where the teacher, what it is that you want her to be, and uh, what you want her to achieve. The assessment uh, he talked uh, he talked here about the importance of collecting data from the teacher. Uh, you can do that through classroom observation. You can do that through, we at, at, at the Governor's Village STEM Academy, we have, what, we have what is called pulse check, where we go by a teacher's classroom at least twice or three times a week. Mm -hmm. And that, we only go for like maybe five minutes, mm -hmm. but it gives us an insight into the teacher. It, we, we can see her growth and we can also see her growth. Now, so kind of when you it. do these walkthroughs, do you use the instrument that CMS developed? No, we have one that our principal developed. It's a very brief, brief. It's only but you do minutes. have an instrument but, yeah, when you go in the room. I, that's what I want yeah, to know. No, okay. Do, yeah, we do have an instrument, but that one that he talked about is uh, it's a Google form that we we go in for like five minutes and we talk about growth mm -hmm. if we see something and uh, uh, growth. So that has been very good because it gives us a head start. We don't have to wait until we have the formal observation or the, the set, not the set, uh, when you just walk, just go in the class. All right, so this is from, the, le from the legal perspective. When you do pulse checks, look-ins, walk, walk-throughs, whatever, whatever you want to call them, uh -huh. if you don't have an instrument, you can't use that data in a teacher's evaluation. Let me say that again. Oh, yeah. You must have an instrument, whether the school developed it, the principal, or the district. If you do not have an instrument, you cannot bring that data into teacher performance. Yes. We have a we have a Google form that he mm -hmm. created the principal for the post. Yes, that's that, that's what I mean. You, but yes, a that. lot of folks think that they can do walkthroughs or look-ins and, and not have and just just go just go stay in the room for five minutes. You can do that. But if you're doing it for the purpose of assessment, you must have a document. Mm -hmm. You must have a form or you must have something that, that says that when and where you were in the room and what you saw. If you want to use that for the purpose of assessment, mm -hmm. that's due process. So just like if you want to bring teacher performance data, you absolutely, you have a validated measure from EVOS. If you want to use, uh, if you want to use evaluation data, you have NESIS, the system. And if you want to use walkthrough data, you must have a, an instrument that you use. If you want to do teacher assessment. All right, please continue. And uh, he also talked about uh, collaborative, uh, collaborating with the teachers, which is something that we do at at uh, at, our, at Governor's Village STEM Academy. And we sit down and we have to we have to set clear goals and and attainable goals. And I have done that with a teacher through post text, and she's one of our art teachers. And she wrote down she writes down at least five um, five disciplines of her per week, and it's it's a lot. So I ended up going into her classroom to, to see. And she has classroom management uh, she has issues. Yeah. And, and so what we did is what I sat with her and one of the goals that we did was try to reduce discipline per week. But how can we do that? We have to set goals. 
So we talked about some techniques, you know, trying to improve, increase her student engagement. The kids were bored to death. And she's an art teacher. So we had to work with that. And we also had to work with some classroom management uh, strategies, like, for example, you know, seating arrangements and what have you. So we talked about that in the classroom. So, and we also, we also talked about reflective uh, practices, and which is very crucial. You have to be able to reflect on your instructional uh, practice and also see how you can improve from that. And we are also, as, as, as leaders, we play a, a crucial role in that as well. Like I, meet with, I meet with a teacher and talk about that. How can we, uh, let's reflect and how can we improve and move forward? Because at the end of the day, we want to include, in, in, uh, increase student achievement. So he talked also about uh, supervision and planning process, that it should be tailored to the individual needs of the teacher. So we have an art teacher, she has issues. We have another teacher who, had, uh, who was not able to relate very well to our ML community. So we had to talk about um, culturally sensitive classrooms. So we had to tailor the need to the teacher. And we also have to uh, look at the experienced teachers, and I call them our unsung heroes because we're so focused on the new teachers. Sometimes we forget about the experienced teachers, and we can use them as leaders. We can use them as I have teachers go to their classroom to observe, like peer observation. So they are also very vital to the to the culture of the school. So he he talked also about data driven instruction. So we have to look at data, and that drives the instruction. I always look at data in, at the beginning with my teachers and see where the students are and where and how what can we do to get them to the next to the next level. So this is what I mentioned earlier: goal setting with the teachers when you collaborate together, you set goals, and then you also have to plan out an action plan. Where is it that we're trying to go? What are the steps that we're trying to get to improve our their practices and also to improve student achievement for the kids? Do you have any questions so far? We good? Nope. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going to, we're going to talk when we get done, but no, I'm good. Everything's good okay. so far. Okay. Thank you. So uh, at the end of the day, we want to build a culture of continuous improvement. And by that, uh, Glitman says, feels that it should not be a one, it has to be a continuous process. You can't just help. You can't uh, just say help we're done. Kids. You can't just uh, coach or, or mentor or collaborate with a teacher one time and that's it. It has to be a continuous process. You provide feedback and we do. Whether it's through pulse check, observation, you have to provide some kind of feedback to the teacher so they know where they are. And it has to be continuous. And you also do that through professional development. And that was it. So it's about teacher effectiveness. That was what the chapter was about. Any questions so far before we move on to the next? I didn't go too fast. Nope, you're good. I'm just, I'm just talking about my experience, okay? Yes. The, the school. That's so, what we want to hear. Okay, that's awesome. So this is it. Now, chapter 14. Chapter 14 is that is the actual implementation. So here they talk about the execution of the plan. So you're meeting with the teachers, so now you're talking about how you're going to execute the plan. So they talked about... Um, Setting goals, like I mentioned earlier, you have to talk about strategies, where it is that you're trying to, where it is that you're trying to go. Are you, you have any questions, Sarah? Oh, not Sarah. Any questions, anybody? No? Okay. And you have to be, you have to, we have to support the teachers. And like I said earlier, it has to be an ongoing support during this, uh, this phase, implementation phase. And you also, the monitoring has to be regular. It can just be a one-time monitor. All right, let's stop right there. Uh -huh. All right, <clears throat> this monitoring process is also known as what? What type of assessment is the monitoring process also known as? Coaching. Formative assessment. Oh, formative, yes, yes, you're right. Formative assessment, yes. Formative right. assessment. Formative right. assessment is, right. is not of the teacher. Formative assessment is of how we go to make sure that this is being done, who's going to go do it, and how they're going to do it. 
This yeah, is a fidelity right. check to make sure that that things are being implemented. This is on us as the as the supervising group, the coach, the assistant principal, the principal, whoever is monitoring this teacher. What's our plan going to be? That's called a formative assessment plan. Who's going to go watch? Who's going to go do a walkthrough? Who's going to go do a look in? Who's going to do a formal observation? Who's going to do this? What what materials are we going to use? Somebody has to be responsible to make sure all of that is happening. Yeah. That that You're monitoring right. is actually going on. We can have all the plans in the world, but if they're not being implemented with fidelity, who is going to go and and make sure it happens. So this is kind of like overseeing the overseers. This is one of the places where we fall down. We make these wonderful growth plans and improvement plan for teachers and we hand it to them, but we don't, we don't hold ourselves accountable to go and check to make sure this is happening. So a, a formative evaluation plan speaks to the people who are doing the evaluating. What are you gonna do? When are you going to go? How's it going to happen? It won't just happen because you want it to. I've seen too many times we develop these action plans or these improvement plan for teachers. We hand it to the teacher, but we never go to make sure it's happening or we don't hold ourselves accountable to go. I'm too busy. See, the reason why we don't do monitoring or why we don't do formative because it's more work on us. It's easier to just develop a plan, agree on it, and everybody just go on about their business. But if, if they know you're not coming to check or if there's no plan of how you're going to check or when you're going to come and check, it won't happen. So that's the part, you know, I'm not being real clear on this point, but the whole idea of is in order to put a real monitoring plan in place, you have, you have to hold yourself as the supervisor accountable. And that's why I don't see a lot of it. I see a lot of plans, but then we got to write down who's going to go and do what, where, and when. You have to commit. I'm going to do X number of walkthroughs. I'm going to do this many evaluations. We're going to do this many coaching sessions. We're going to, we're going to pull this person in, into th this, that, or the other one-on-one -on -one small group or whatever. And so a an actual monitoring plan, a formative assessment plan, is, is the work that you're going to do as the supervisor. And there's a lot of it. And that's why I see plenty of plans, but not much following through on the monitoring or the formative assessment piece, because it's a lot more work. You say, well, I'm doing more work than a teacher. If, if you're doing it right, you absolutely will be. You absolutely will be doing more work than the teacher if you if you do it right. All right, please continue. And that was the next one. You were, yep. yeah, you, were, you talked about that, the formative assessment. That yes, was like, yeah. that's yeah. exactly yeah. right. That's why I said before we got to that slide, give us yeah. the big reveal here. Yes, you, you're right. And then the summative, that's actually the the final, and that's the the success of the of the plans and all the changes. The uh, uh, he talked also about the data driven evaluation, and then we had to uh, allow. Is if the 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 Evaluation is successful depending on the source or the data source. And you have to look at that. That drives also the uh, the instruction within the classroom. So we talked about the teacher uh, self-assessment, the classroom observations, and student performance. And as I said earlier, um, that's how we're able to measure the success of the um, of the teachers. We talked also here again, like in chapter 13, the continuous reflection. So we have to teacher encourage to reflect on their instruction throughout the implementation, and it's and it's true because I used to I, I used to meet with that our teacher once a week, so we would give uh, she would meet with the MCL, all of us in the in the conference room, and then they would provide her and us with some strategies. So we she had to come and talk to us every Thursday about the strategies. Did it work? Did it not work? And how can we improve it? And so and that's and that's the next plan: adjusting the plan. So we met with her once a week. Um, as, as I said earlier, it's a teacher and supervisor collaboration that's very, very important. It, it empowers the teacher because she feels part of the process. And also peer observation is also very, very uh, powerful. So we had her go, we have an, our teacher in upper, which is the middle school. And by her going to observe her classroom, 
she was able to um, to, in, to give some insight. Even the way her classroom was decorated, the way her classroom was decorated was very different than the art teacher in upper. So everything was enlightening for her. Rebecca, is it too small? Rebecca, is it too small? Can you? No? Okay. That's not her squinching. Okay, so we talked about, um, oh, this is uh, resistance. She resisted. The teacher, our teacher resisted at first. She thought that we, uh, she she felt attacked in, in the beginning, but she was not really attacked. We, she, she was a very, very talented art teacher, but she just needed some some coaching a little bit. So when, once we acknowledged the fact that she was very talented and that she was produce, producing good work from her scholars, we just needed to help her a little bit refine the chaos in her classroom. And we were willing to work side by side with her. So she was able to, she came around, she came around. But it took us a little bit of, you know, talking to her. We also have to ad adapt to the diverse needs of our, of our scholars. There are some scholars, you know, the ML community is, uh, is growing daily. We also have uh, kids from various cultures. We have to be able to reach and teach all scholars. So we have the ML teachers on, on, on hand. We have I'm there for the teachers. And we also have workshops and PDs for culturally sensitive classrooms that we offer to, the, to our, our teachers. So uh, we provide feedback, constructive feedback all the time. And the teachers have to be also willing to, to, to receive. And then at the end of the day, we do want the best interest. We do want to keep the teachers there. We want them to stay, but we have to provide the support for them to stay. And if they know that that's, that's our intent, that we do value them, we just want to improve the instructional delivery, they are more receptive to feedback. And at the end of the day, like I'm saying, we want long-term impact. We want them to stay. And we want student achievement. So, um, Leadership role, we play, we play, I find myself to be an instructional, instructional leader. I like to be in the classroom. I like to coach teachers. I like to be in the, I like to be with my scholars. So I, we play a crucial role in, in sustaining the, the culture. And we have to always focus on instructional improvement. And it's not a one-time thing. It's a continuous thing all year. Do we have any questions? So this is just, I concluded what I said. You good? So it involves collaboration. We have to always, it's always ongoing reflection, data-driven decision-making, so. This was actually very good. These two chapters were actually, it had yeah. me reflect a little bit on what we do at our school. And I mm -hmm. gave a copy of this to the admin team because we are doing, we are doing this. Yeah. So they were very appreciative of these two chapters. Yeah. Michelle, I like the, the approach that you took here. You related this to your job. That's this is supposed to inform your practice. We just don't just do this for, you know, we could just give you the book, but you're supposed to take these chapters as Michelle did and reflect upon practice what goes on and how this would affect your practice. Um mm -hmm. that that's the whole notion of, of these chapters. And so you did a very good job of relating it to how it works in the real world. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for your presentation tonight. You can stop your share. All right, I have a question for the group. The question is, is why don't parents ground their kids for behavior issues? You because see? it grounds them too. There you go. There you go. Because they have to stay at home with them, don't they? They have to be there too. Why don't why don't we put more teachers on action plans or improvement plans? Because we'd have to be in the room with them, wouldn't we? We'd have mm -hmm. to go. We'd have to put ourselves on a contract too to be there. That formative assessment. That's why we don't do better on, on that. And that's why we pass the trash. We have teachers that aren't any good. And instead of working with them to get better, we just encourage them to transfer somewhere else, or we move them somewhere they don't hurt us as bad. That's that's the issue. That's exactly Sarah's exactly right. We don't ground our kids because we'd have to stay home with them. We don't put teachers on improvement plans or 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 action plans because we would have to go to the room. You know, 
we want to we want to walk through a room for a minute or two and call that a walkthrough. No, if you didn't bring an if you didn't bring an instrument with you, that's not a walkthrough. That's just a waste of your time unless you just want to be seen. Um, that there's no data from that that you can use to, to help a teacher improve. It needs to be written down. All right, so here's the thing. This is this is a thing as well. When Michelle talked about, she has an art teacher who does at least five discipline referrals a week, and they, they consider that to be a lot in the school that they're in. Um, when teachers do excessive discipline referrals, what that really means is they're not accepting accountability for the outcomes of their students. Now, in this case, it's clear in art and some others, there's no state test. They don't feel any accountability. It's easier to see their, pro their behavior external to the learning process in the room. That's, you know, that's them kids, that's somebody else's problem. They don't accept any ownership in that. Now, in ML programs, ESL, um, teachers don't accept ownership in their achievement because of the language barrier. You know, them kids can't speak English, not my fault. But again, they don't accept responsibility for outcome. And then core academic teachers, their, their excuses are usually, well, these kids are so low proficiency or, you know, them kids race. They don't want, they don't call it race, but it's them kids. And either that or them kids in terms of wealth, low wealth. When teachers excessively send kids out of their room for what you know could is 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 just basically classroom management issues. I'm not talking about you know one slap the other one out on the floor. I'm talking about for for minor things. That's a that's a symptom of a bigger problem that you need to be able to set and, and see that when you so classroom management is is not just about the things you do. It's an attitude of I'm responsible for these kids. They can't learn if I continue to send them to the office. I've got to address these behaviors and get these kids participating. I've got to get them engaged in what I'm doing. That's a lack of engagement. And usually that lack of engagement is preceded by a lack of accountability on the part of the teacher. And, and if you want them to improve either their instructional program or their classroom management, which are tied together, they, they must accept the accountability for the outcomes in, of the children in that room. And until they do that, no amount of coaching, no amount of improvement or action plans is going to change that until they accept accountability for the outcomes in that room. What do they do at Jones Sausage? They make sausage. What do we do in school? We teach kids. That's our core competency. They have to accept that. And, and accept that they are accountable for that, for, for student learning. That's their job. And until they do, none of this will work. Now, once they do, and that's a part of that coaching, that outcomes matter. Student outcomes matter. It's not just inputs. Student outcomes matter. I would never, so this is kind of my bottom line here. I would never seek to assess teachers just simply by doing walkthroughs and evaluations. You need student data. You need student data. The bottom line has to be the bottom line. Too many times we don't want to have those critical conversations about how their kids are or aren't doing. That, that, that should be leading the conversation every time what kids get or don't get and keep the focus on, on, on student learning. If you want to build a continuous improvement model in your school, if you want the culture to be that of teaching and learning, you can never lose focus on the important part is what are the kids learning or not. Can't be about you or your comfort or discomfort or what you want to teach or not, or your schedule or when you have planning and can I leave and go get lunch. The focus has to be maintained every day on student learning. That's the only way that continuous improvement works. It's the only way. And that's the part that we assume passed and don't and don't and don't get to. We got to focus on that first. 
that we are accountable for student outcomes. That's what supervision of instruction, that's the heart of supervision. That's the heart of the Glickman book is that we are responsible for outcomes for the instruction. Not just presenting it, not just the effort, but the outcomes. We have to accept it as school leaders and teachers have to accept it as teachers of children. In absence of that accountability piece, you will never have continuous, you won't have any improvement. You'll get what you always got because you did what you always did. And again, putting teachers on improvement plans and action plans and working with them is hard on us. It's like grounding us because we got to show up and do all these things. And if you're not willing to do that and make a plan and commit to that plan, that formative assessment plan of who's going to go do what, where, and when, then you're just, if you just make it plans and handed it to them, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. I told you the story of RTI. One of my protégés that I hired as a beginning teacher, he's an elementary principal. His reading scores stayed the same for three years, even though they implemented response, uh, response to intervention, you know, prior to MTSS a few years ago. Three years of that program, their reading scores were exactly the same. I went to do an audit, it took me 20 minutes. I came back and said, you don't have an RTI program. You said, what are you talking about? I said, well, the lady that's in charge of going to the rooms and making sure those prescriptive lessons are being delivered doesn't go. Said she doesn't have time, that she just has the teacher sign a logbook. They're not happening. I knew that before I came. It would be a near impossibility that you ran a program for three years and got exactly the same scores if the program was actually being implemented. They are starting teaching the lessons. Nobody's going to check. You handed it to them and said, here, do this. But nobody went to see if they were doing it. The lady said she doesn't go to the rooms. And the teachers know that she's not coming. What's the probability that those lessons are happening? None. You don't have a formative assessment built into this. You've got the content of what you want, but nobody's going to make sure it's being delivered with fidelity. This problem is an easy problem to solve. Either you or somebody on your team or her or, or whoever you, after you fire her and replace her with, it's got to go to the room and make sure that those lessons are being delivered. Now, that's a lot of work. I think we're so busy. Well, then it ain't going to happen. You get to choose. If I was you, I'd fire her and get me somebody that would go if you're too busy to go. That's up to you. But that's not happening. The lessons are not being delivered. Simple. Very simple. So thinking that you've made this wonderful plan and handed it to the teacher, just like RTI, they paid a fortune for those lessons. They made a plan, handed it to the teachers. To think that if you don't go and look, it's going to happen. You're not smart enough to be in school administration. That's what Glickman's telling you. Formative assessment is key to the whole thing. Best plans in the world aren't worth the paper they're written on if they don't get implemented. And if you don't go and check, they won't. Think about it. If they knew and were willing to do this stuff already, they'd already done it. And that speaks to accepting responsibility and accountability. First thing you got to do is convince them that they're accountable for this. Now here we're going to help. Them. But, you know, you, you got to be a willing participant in this. As the teacher. So that's where that is. All right, Michelle, excellent job tonight. Short. I like how she did her slides. She just had the big ideas. That's what we're talking about. Big ideas and be able to speak to this. And when you can relate it to your personal experience, that's so much more powerful as a leader. People will listen to that. That's what we're looking for. You're trying to develop your personal power here. Thank, right. thank you, sir. To, to, to lead a group of people. Stephen, are you with us? He's unmuted. He's alive. No camera, though. You want to see me? I don't. I, that's okay. up to you. You got a presentation for us tonight on chapters? I got a little something. Good. We want to hear it. I'm turning the floor over to you. I'll stop my I'm... share so you can start yours. I don't know why my video is not videoing. Hmm. See there again. Never know when stuff's gonna work. There I am. You see me? I got the lights on. Okay. 
Yep. If you can move your camera a little bit more, we can miss we can, we can miss all your face. We can only see half of it. Huh? <laughs> There you go. All right. What you got for us tonight? All right. Can y'all see it? Is it is it showing yet? It says my you're screen sharing. We don't see anything on it yet. Yeah, my computer is running slow. And it's getting on my nerves. It says it's loading. Good. There we go. All right. I click the button, it's just taking forever to cooperate. Huh, there we go, look at there. All right, hey y'all people, it's him, <laughs> I'm him. We're going to talk about the Glitman chapters 10 through 12 tonight. Let me move this out of my way. All right, so chapter 10, focus on classroom observations, right? So chapter 10 was talking about the importance of classroom observations um, and how it is a central component of instructional leadership. So in that, we talked about the different varieties of classroom observations where you have the scripted notes, you have the selective verbatim, you have the checklist, you have the coding, all different types of observations that give you information on what it is that is going inside of the classroom. Then that moved into the different types of data collection, factual versus objective. And is factual the same as objective? Is it different and why? The Glitman chapters also gave readers information on what it was that we should focus on primarily as it relates to observations. Whenever you're going in the classroom, what are you looking for? Are you just going in and walking around to see if there's academic monitoring going on? Are you walking around to see if students are engaged? Are they doing that turn and talk? What exactly are you looking for? Which then goes right back into what pre-conferences are for. During your pre-conferences, you're supposed to figure out, okay, so what is the standard that you're going going to be teaching? What's the EQ that you're going to be teaching? What's the ICANN that you're going to be covering? And then once you are in the classroom, seeing what that looks like coming to life during the observation. One thing that I know that I ask whenever I'm doing observations, I ask them, aside from all of the stuff that is on the tool, I say, what do you want me to look for specifically? So that I know, okay, they know that they are having a problem in this area or this area right here is a highlight for them. They think that they're very strong in this area, so they want me to look for this. And so along with the two, I do look for that extra piece that they ask me to identify. Sometimes they don't ask me to identify anything. They just want me to look at the class holistically, which is completely fine. Now we're talking about the three different types of observations. So as you have directive, which is supervisor led primarily given specific guidance um and that is usually for the newer teachers or struggling teachers who need that structured feedback then you go into that collaborative where it is both teacher and supervisor and they're sharing that responsibility and interpreting what the observation um is for and usually that's for experienced teacher who wants to refine their skills. Then we move into the non-directive. Can you say non-directive? Great. Non-directive. That's where the teacher takes more control, allowing for self-directed reflection and improvement suitable for those veteran teachers. I had a teacher ask me today, what, it, what does it mean to be a veteran teacher? And I asked, what do you think it means? And then we were able to expand on that. 
Now, one of the major things that this chapter highlighted on was timely and constructive feedback and how feedback should focus on growth using specific data from the observation to facilitate improvement. Reflection is a big part of that as well. Teachers should be encouraged to self-reflect, fostering a cycle of continuous improvement. But we also have to keep in mind while we are doing these observations that it's not about judgment, but about growth and improvement for both teachers and the students. Then we move into chapter 11, where we're talking about direct assistance for our teachers, right? And that this chapter had several different concepts, as you can see here. So first, it's important to always define what it is that you are looking for, right? So in this chapter, the purpose was to continue exploring direct assistance by emphasizing individual support and mentorship, right? That's what this whole chapter was talking about. It's talking about boosting teacher confidence. It's talking about mentoring programs. It's talking about what data-driven coaching looks like. And then it builds, it refers back to that self-reflection piece and a time. So it gives us a little bit of different types of what kind of assistance can be given to teachers. So let's talk about them very briefly. Let's talk about model. Modeling here, supervisors or mentors, they demonstrate effective um, teaching techniques. So you're gonna go in a classroom with a teacher that you know is struggling for whatever the reason may be, and you're going to show them how to specifically engage with students in the form that you are looking for as it relates to the observational tool, as well as it is whenever you're supposed to be teaching to the standard. Then that moves into something completely different that is co-teaching, similar but different, where you are teaching alongside the teacher to provide real-time support and feedback. Now, in my district, that can be done by the district coach. It can be done by the MCL, multi-classroom leader, or the admin that is over the content area. So for me, I'm over ELA. I have two sixth grade classrooms that asked me to come in and teach their lessons so so that they will understand how it was supposed to go. See, that wasn't co-teaching. That was more of a form of modeling, whereas the MCL came into the classroom and co-taught with the teacher or our um, inclusion teachers for our students who have IEPs, they come in and they co-teach with them to differentiate instruction. Then we're going, to, we're going to move on down to coaching, where you're offering regular check-ins, advice, and specific strategies for improvement. So you're not necessarily at the front of the classroom model. You're not necessarily at the front of the classroom helping the teacher teach a specific lesson, but you're coaching them along the way. You're giving them feedback. Okay, so I see that you did this. Did you notice that your students were da-da-da-da-da? So maybe you need to look at possibly doing this instead, and then your students will engage differently. Then we're going to talk about our last one, consulting, where you're providing expert feedback and advice to solve particular challenges. Okay, so in your classroom, while I was in there, I saw that your students in the back, they were giggling, they were laughing, they were disengaged. So how about we do this? We know that they're disengaged because they didn't understand the material. So we're going to restructure our classroom environment. We're going to now create groups where we have high, mid, low high mid low mid and we're going to push for peer facilitation so that you can now work more concretely more closely with these students that you know are below where it is that you need them to be so that way th that small group will be more specific and more goal oriented then we're going to move on down to professional development and this was one of the last things that was talked about in my three chapters and as we move to professional development we need to make sure that we understand that this is a key component of instructional leadership as Glitton has stated in the chapters. So let's talk about what professional development is for a second. So Glitman defines professional development as the continuous learning process that allows teachers to stay updated with educational trends, methods, and technologies. Those were the three main highlights that he focused on. Trends, methods, and technologies. So then that went down into talking about the characteristics of what an effective PD looked like. 
It talked about if it should be job embedded, which has been directly related to the teachers they've been working, if it should be ongoing and sustained, which is rather than one-off workshops, PD should be an ongoing process with follow-up. And that's that key component with follow-up. It's okay to say, oh, I'm going to train you on this and then I'm going to free you. And then there's no wraparound. There's no link back to the core idea. And then we're talking about being aligned with student learning needs where your PD should aim to improve student outcomes, not just teacher knowledge. It's great that you went to this professional development training and you got this extra knowledge, but how does that benefit your students? If I can't tell that your students are benefiting from the training that you are going, is the training necessary? Is the training relative? How significant is it? Is it truly that important? All things that we should consider. And then I was talking about PD being a collaborative process where it should encourage collaboration among the teachers in PLCs or teacher networks where they can share ideas, share strategies, and share feedback. Those are the main highlights of what a PD is supposed to be used for. So as we move deeper into the different types of models for professional development, we have workshops and seminars where these are supposed to be things where you provide structured learning on specific topics, but they are most effective when followed up with practical application and reflection. Again, we had, we're hearing that word reflection that we've heard for the past two chapters, which tells me that it's very, very important for us to go back and look at what we're learning and see if it's actually been aligned to a common goal. Then we're talking about PLCs. My district calls them PLTs. I don't know why, but that's what they felt the need for it to be. Same difference. In these PLCs, you have these communities where you're allowing teachers to collaborate on shared goals. You're discussing how PLCs foster a supportive environment for teachers to continuously learn and refine their practices. That is where that collaborative piece comes in. You should not be in a PLC where one person is doing all the talking, one person is doing this, one person is doing that, and nothing is being combined. It's where we are bouncing ideas off of each other. Oh, I think that it this works best in my classroom, and this is how I do it. How do you do it, X, Y, and Z? Oh, okay, so let's look at the research here. It shows that da, 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 da. So because of that, now we can now do this, and because we can now do this, we're going to look forward to doing X, Y, and Z in that collaborative piece. Let's talk about action research now, where teachers conduct their own research into their classroom practices, allowing them to tailor their PD to their students' needs, and then expand on the idea that this research leads to practical improvements in teaching and learning, which is a standard that they also have to meet whenever you're doing their evaluations. It's going to ask, are, is your teachers doing research-based learning whether it's helping those students with special needs or the class holistically. Then we're gonna move into peer observation and feedback. You wanna explain how peer observation creates a collaborative learning environment where teachers can observe and learn from each other. Whenever we have observations and then my content area is ELA, when we come together after um, observations have been done, I give that teacher time to talk about how the observation went, how the pre-conference went, how the post-conference went, and what happened in the classroom so that teachers who have not who have not had the observation yet will know, okay, so whenever they're coming in, these are some of the things that they're looking for. This is a way that I could move up in the standards, move from proficient to accomplished, to distinct, to distinguish. These are the different ways. What exactly is that interactional piece whenever I'm trying to move up to accomplish? What is an in a extension that is going to be sustained to make it distinguished, not just something for me to move up levels in an observation. And then after all that is done, you want to make sure that you have evaluation and a follow-up process because PD should be assessed for its effectiveness. And then that is where school leaders should use the student performance data and teacher feedback to evaluate whether or not PD efforts are sustained and make necessary adjustments. So when we bring it all together and we have our key takeaways, we have three different categories where we're gonna talk about the importance, the relevance, and the significance. When you look at the importance of it all, you know that professional development is something that should be ongoing, something that should be collaborative, and something that should directly impact student success. If it is not doing that, 
then that means it is not important to the goal that you're trying to achieve. When we look at the relevance, when you are given assistance, the method should be tailored to the individual teacher's needs. Yes, it's good to have an idea for the overarching of your staff, but whenever you get down to the nitty gritty and you're supporting a teacher, what does that teacher need for their classroom at that time? It's okay to have a good idea for the collective, but when we are looking in a classroom, oh, this teacher struggles with engagement. The other teacher may not struggle with engagement. They may struggle with behavior management, which is something completely different in itself. Yes, the kids are getting the work done, but they are hell raisers. How can we account for that? And then lastly, but not least, the significance of it all. When you are going into the classrooms and you're doing your observations, it should focus on the objective data and foster teacher reflection. If there is no data being looked at while you are doing this, if the data is not at the forefront, how can you give any kind of feedback, any type of evaluation that is actually true, where a teacher can then take that and say, hmm, maybe I can do this, maybe I can try this, or go and then do research on their own and say, hey, I can bring this back and now I can implement this because research says this will help increase this. If that is not there, then how significant is a classroom observation to the teacher's growth and sustained professional development? Do we have any questions, comments, concerns? A lot. Excellent presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you can stop your share now. Um, Stephen just echoed the things that I said before. I We kind of skipped his part and went to Michelle's, and so I tried to highlight some of the important things from Stephen's, and, but thank you, Stephen. It was an excellent presentation. You hit all the right notes. Um, you need you need objective data. That's why I said you've got to have that growth data when you're doing teacher observations. Um, your professional development, effective professional development, looks more at what students needs than what faculty wants. I know that sounds harsh. I get accused of all times of hating teachers. I do not hate teachers, but you must hold them accountable. How many times have you seen teachers that want to go to certain workshops because they enjoy that or they enjoy the town that or the city that it's in? Professional development, effective professional development is, is organized around what kids need, not what teachers want. What kids need through their teachers. Now, I do not advocate what Gardner Webb does, but Gardner Webb is a university. Gardner Webb will not pay for you to go to a conference unless you're presenting your own research. Now, we're supposed to be learned on all these other things. The only reason that we're supposed to be going to a conference is to present. I, I get that at the university level. But if we extrapolate that for the K-12 world, we don't need to be sending or letting teachers go or developing pro professional development around things that they're already competent and good at. Because that's the stuff that people like to do. People like to do things that they're good at. They don't like to do things that they're not good at. If you let them, I hear all this time, you know, do, do teachers have a voice in their professional development? Do they get to choose? That's not a good thing. They'll choose the stuff that they want rather than what kids need, by extension, what they need. You must plug them into that. You cannot just let them do the stuff that they want. They'll get better at the one thing that they're good at, but they won't get any better at the things that they're not good at. But Stephen's absolutely correct. You need objective data. Now, when you talked about observations take on different forms, I want to talk, I, I, maybe maybe Stephen might, he's the expert on this one tonight. We know what scripting is. We know what checklists are. That's why I was referring to Michelle. When you Most of the time when you do a walkthrough, you do a checklist. That's, that's, that's a thing. I mean, it's, it's recognized. Um, and if, without it, it's not an observation. It's not a walkthrough. It's nothing. You can't bring any of that data with you. So normally when we do walkthroughs or look-ins, we use a checklist. When we do a full NESIS observation, we usually do a script. What is coding? Tell me about what coding is and how we most 
frequently use it. Stephen, you can answer or anybody else. I, I want to know about coding. Rebecca, I know you got it on your mind. What is coding? Okay, so Jonathan and I are the same room. Hold on. While she goes to do that, coding is categorizing behavior for analysis. That's yep. what coding is. And Absolutely. You, you predetermine the themes, right? And mm -hmm. you look for things that are in those categories. Yep. That's exactly right. Now, why did I ask this question? All you got to do a dissertation. Many of you will do qualitative work in that dissertation. Not very many of you will do a quantitative only. Not many of you will do a quantitative only. You'll either do a qualitative or a mix, quantitative and qualitative. Understand, when we get a transcript of an interview or a focus group, we code it. We do coding. We do. We either do deductive coding where we pick the things that we're looking for, and then we find, you know, did did did, did these did these things happen? Did these phrases happen? Or we do inductive where we let the computer software find the things for us. But the whole idea of coding is to find certain things. Are there certain themes present for the purpose of evaluation? If you're doing coding evaluations, you got to know what you're looking for. Marzano's nine. Are they are they present? Are they evident? What are the look for?s So if you're doing coding, one of the things that I see is is a mistake a lot of times with emerging leaders is they're doing coding, but that but the coding it's like seventy three different themes. It's too much. You've got. I'm not saying coding is bad. I'm saying if you do it bad, it's bad. You need in that pre-conference that Stephen was talking about, that's where you say, what should I be looking for? That's that's a coding interview. Remember when he said that? When you do the pre-conference and you speak to the teacher about what should I be looking for? That's for coding. Too many folks don't understand that. They're telling you these are the things that you should be looking for. That's a coding interview. Then when you go, what are you doing? You're looking for those things they told you, right? That's coding. That's coding. Don't just walk in and say, what did I see? And have a, a, a list of 100 different codes of different things that you saw. No. If you're doing a coding evaluation, you and the teacher need to agree on what the teacher wants you to see. Those are codes or themes that come out of those codes. That's, that's how that works. Too many times we don't understand that. They tell us what to look for, and then we go in and script, or we do a checklist. No, you're, you're looking for these things. That's that's a coding interview. You've already prearranged what you're looking for, those codes. Are they there? And then you write down the phrases that represent what they said that you should see. That's how coding works. Um, and then that gives us our overall things for that lesson, the things that we need to work on or not work on. But again, they tell you what to look for. You write down the phrases that match that or, you know, the things that you saw that match that, those codes. Uh, and that that's a good way. Now, I like that. I like that, but not so much for beginning teachers. Why is why is that Stephen shook his head? Stephen knows because he does this every day. I don't, but I've done it. Why does coding not work real well, beginner, Stephen? You know, it, you know this answer. Well, I hope my answer is the same as yours, because for me, whenever I'm trying to, whenever I look at what coding is, beginning teachers are still trying to find their way. They're not an, an expert yet. They're still trying to make sure that they that, can apply. There the you go. They're not, their, their level of confidence, co confidence is not there yet to, to call their shots. I mean, that's like, you know, that's like Steph Curry saying, I'm going to hit it off the backboard of the bleacher and then <laughs> bank it in. You've seen Steph do that. I watched him in the gym at Davidson do stuff like that when he was just a kid. Um, and so you got to be, you got to be at a certain level to be able to call your shots. Most beginners are not. 
So I would encourage you, even if they want to, don't try to do coding observations with beginners. Um, it will go it will go very badly for them and for you. You know, our job is while while we're doing evaluation, we're we're trying to set them up for as much success as possible. Doing doing coding observation is a higher level. They have to have a higher level of skill to pull it off as well. It's not as easy as it looks. Um, trust me, when you get to chapter four, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's not as easy as it looks to do coding um, and to set that up. And so one of the ways that the, the, the hack or the cheat that I do is we do it by computer. We let it find what it finds. Now, that's a risk. You might have to rewrite chapter two, but we don't predetermine our, our, our themes. We do inductive coding and let the computer find it. And if we did a good job with our interviews and asked the right question, then all those codes and things will be there. They were represented in the questions that we asked. But that's a higher level. That's a higher skill level to do those. And so the point of this long-winded is don't jump in with beginners on coding type evaluations. That, that's, that's an advanced skill set. Uh, I would stick to scripting with them and checklists. And develop them where eventually you can do that, but they they they're not they're not they can't call their shots yet. Um, that that's difficult for them, um, and it puts a lot of it puts a lot more pressure on them as well um, to be able to pull it off. Um, you know, that's one thing about it is is when you know when you call your shot, you put a lot of pressure on yourself. The beginners don't need the added pressure of coding uh, observation and evaluation. Um, that that's a higher level skill for more advanced teachers. That takes them from good to great. I hate to use Collins' as a metaphor, but really coding is is designed to take good teachers, competent teachers, to that next level. In my opinion, it's not a novice or beginner technique. So be careful with it. Um, checklists are good for beginners. Now, you don't want to do checklists always with them, but checklists are good for beginners um, because you can, it's easy to see, it's objective, it's not an information overload for them, um, and, it, and they don't discourage them as much as, as other types of evaluation. So that's why it's always good. Again, know your audience, know who you're leading. We talked about that before. Um, you're basically using task and relationship behaviors and situational leadership. Um, and you you can't you, you can't you can't overwhelm your beginners um, if, by asking them to do too much. Um, you need to do a lot of the thinking. But again, to kind of summarize for the evening, the takeaways, Make sure your evaluation system fits the level of the client that you have, the teacher, from, from Stevens. That's that's important, but being there doing those things. And from Michelle's, again, if you put people on improvement plans or action plans, it's more work on you. But that's the only way that you're going to be sure that the improvement happens is if you go and check. If you just tell them to do it, develop the plan and send it to them, it's almost 100% that it won't happen. Uh, the important part is that you're there with them, just like when you ground your kids. The important part is that you're there with them and what you're doing with them, not just send them to the room, find things to engage your own children when you ground them. Um, and and it's, it's you know, it, it's, it can work, but you got to be there with them. As Sarah said, you have to ground yourself. Uh, and that's, that's, that's it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. You have to be there with them. You have to be willing to be there with them. All right. Again, um, that will be that will be all for the evening in terms of presentations. Anybody have any questions? Um, I do want to point out one thing. I had a question from the other group today, and let me see if I've got it in the wrong place in this shell too. I swear it wasn't here. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, so weekend to
All right. Either I fixed it or it was there. Somehow this one right here got put into the Saturday rather than the Sunday. So our next time together, Sunday presentation, there's the district human resources department assignment Dropbox. And of course this assignment is 20 minute on your legal functions and roles, legal functions and roles, what do they have to do in terms of hiring and firing? Um, and then you have this one for your human resources plan. And I've got a template, just a little simple template for you on that one. It's two different things. They're both due that day. Somehow in maybe the other class, that one got moved to Saturday and they wanted to know, was it two different things? Yeah, it's two different things. But it's right in yours. And I'll check theirs right quick to make sure it's right in theirs. But I don't know how that got moved. It's still in there Saturday. Yep. So one of them is, because I was going to ask about this, one of them is the legal aspect and one yeah, is just hiring and firing. What do they got to do? And the other one is just the big picture of the HR? Right. What, what you know. Basic snapshot information about your district, your staff, your teaching force, numbers, race, who you got, organizational chart, your goals, the job duties, and opportunities for growth within the HR department. This is if you if your goal is to work in, in personnel in HR, human resources. That's a quick and dirty on that. That's just an overview. Uh, that's, and then the other one is, is what are, this is for somebody who might want to work in HR. And there are people who, leadership, who, who, whose desire is to work in human resources, to be the assistant superintendent for human resources and, and launch themselves into a superintendency that way. Um, Steve Laws did that. That's where he came from, HR. That's not, that's not abnormal. I mean, Different people look for different paths according to their interests and abilities how to get to the superintendent. Some go instruction, some go HR, some go facilities and maintenance. The current the current Gaston superintendent came from, from the operations side. Um, the pr one previous to that came from the finance department, was a CFO. Uh, the one previous to that came from HR, Rick Yates. Uh, Reeves, Reeves McGlowan came from HR. I mean, there's different paths in the central office. This is if you're, your path, you want to go to the superintendency through HR, that, that PowerPoint is for you. Now, the other one is for anybody that, that's going to be in, in leadership, what are the roles that HR performs for you? The legal functions, hiring and firing. What do those consist of? What do what what are those legal functions of HR? And it's real simple. Now they have some other things that they have that you know, like employee assistance and things like that. But but there's only two legal things that they have to do: hiring and firing. What are those? I mean, and how does it work? What is the due process? What are the nine things that you got to do to hire somebody? Who takes care of all of those? Who does references? Who does blood tests? For drugs, who does background check? Who does reference check? Who does the content interview? All, all those things. You know, who advertises for the job? How's that done? I mean, all positions start with a position announcement, advertising for the job. That's how a job starts, a position announcement. Who determines that there is one? 
federal, state, local money could be one of those. Who 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 makes that? Who makes that call and, and pulls that trigger and and releases that job announcement? How does that happen? Who says advertise that job? Where did they come up with it? What process is it that starts that? And then once we advertise the job, that'd be the first of the nine things that have to happen until the board approves that person as a new employee. What are the things that have to happen along the way? And then what has to happen along the way to terminate an employee? Where, where, what's the first shot that's fired on that? Somebody turns in a, a, a you know, a what? an action plan that didn't get, that didn't happen or, you know, didn't show up to work or poor, or poor performance review. Where, where does it come from? How does it start? Well, for certified people, if you're doing it based on, you know, misbehavior, now that that's pretty simple. We've got a charge on this person. We'll suspend them without pay with or without pay. And then we'll go through the process. But what are the, what is the process? That's what I'm talking about. You need to know who does what. That's due process. Due process is hiring and firing. What are the steps for hiring and firing? Due process. That's the legal part. The other is you want to work in HR, tell us about this. All right. Is that cleared up, Sarah? Yes, sir. All righty. Everybody's good on that? You know when we're going to meet again? We already covered that. I missed that. When are we meeting again? Look at there. We're meeting again on Saturday, October the 19th. We got three classes in a row of our classmates doing their chapter presentations. And then we'll meet in Charlotte again. And I'll send you, I'll put it in the messages and I'll send an email with a link to a Qualtrics survey for lunch on Saturday. I'm buying lunch. And we'll have lunch. And then uh, obviously we get out in time on Sunday. But that's got class the next three weeks. Or now the next two weeks tonight. Week from now in two weeks. So we got three classes in a row. And then we're in 10 days after that, we're in Charlotte. All right. Any other questions? So you still got nearly a month for your presentations. You're, you're good to go. Any other thing tonight before we go? All right. I appreciate you being with me. Michelle and Jonathan, excellent job tonight on your presentations. Um, excuse me, and Stephen. Um, excellent job, Michelle and Stephen, tonight. Again, Sarah being our star of the week for the points and Michelle being that she got her internship login already for the semester. So that reminds all of us for you to get yours in before the semester is over. Anybody have anything for the good of the group? All right. No, I was just about to say, I mean, you really didn't like mine? Oh, my God. No, I really like yours. Would it, would it hurt your feelings if I was to tell you how impressed I was? That would mean I had low expectations, wouldn't it? But it was really <laughs> good. It was really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just as shocked as you are, I'm sure, that it was that good. But it was great. Absolutely. I liked it. I really <laughs> did. You did a great job, Stephen. I hate to say that. It hurts me. It hurts me to say it. But that was really <laughs> good. Thank um, you. Yeah. You were, you were a star tonight. It might not just be tonight, but, but you were a star tonight. You got that. If nothing <laughs> else, you got that. All right, I'll see y'all next week. Y'all have a good week. Thank you. Stay safe in the storm.